Hello, good evening. It's evening for me. Uh, my name is Leo Bertin, if we haven't met before. Uh, I have now run a few workshops uh, with Suffolk Artlink over the last few years. And unfortunately, the current circumstances meant that my session had to uh, happen online. So uh, with uh, Kasia and the team at Suffolk Artlink, we decided that I would produce this short video. For those of you who couldn't attend the workshop when uh, we did it online, or for those of you who might want to uh, try making the food that we prepared again at home and wanted the ability to kind of pause and linger on some of the explanations. In the workshop that we had together, I uh, showed you how to make a dish from the south of France called panis, as well as an accompanying uh, sauce uh, which has a uh, mayonnaise base. So in this video, you'll also learn how to make uh, mayonnaise if you don't know how to make that already, and you'll learn how to make a vegan alternative. But as well as the food, what really interests me uh, in my practice as an artist chef is to bring creative thinking, creative practice together with uh, cooking and eating with other people. So in particular, what I've been interested in exploring together in this session is the notion of cooking with the senses. So even though I will share recipes with you over the course of this video, and I will show you how to make this uh, dish, panis and the accompanying sauce, I'd really encourage you to think with all five of your senses as you're making it. Think about how the different ingredients, the different uh, elements of technique that we're going to employ feel for you and really be alert to, to, to all five of your senses. There's a quote in this brilliant book by Tom Eagle, uh, which is called First Catch, which I'd really recommend you read if you haven't already, uh, that I really love. So I'll just read it to you. The thing to do is just begin. The question, of course, is where. We think of recipes as more or less scientific sets of instructions, little closed systems that start with an onion and finish at once. When in fact, they are more like short stories about history, about politics, and about love, with obscure morals told in a curious imperative. Every order given to dice this or simmer that has within it a memory I diced this so that we could eat together. I simmered that to keep away the cold. I really love this idea that each recipe is less than a set of instructions, or rather it's more than a set of instructions. It's about how uh, whoever is sharing the recipe has come to uh, that point. So I'd really uh, like to encourage you to think about that as you're cooking, as you're trying out, making panisse, playing with the different flavors that you make add or take away uh, with the recipes that we're making together today. I'll pop over again at the end of the video uh, with a short invitation to participate in a bit of creative writing which might go together with the food that you'll be making. See you soon. To make panis, you will need the following ingredients. First of all, the star of the show, you will need about 150 grams approximately of chickpea flour that you have here in the middle. When you buy it, it'll often have little clumps in the packet, so I would recommend that you sift it prior to starting. You will also need a glug of good quality olive oil, extra virgin ideally, an oil of your choice could work also. A clove of garlic, which you can omit if you would rather not have a little hint of garlic taste in the panis. You could very easily replace it with a bay leaf or other spices once you start experimenting. Some good quality sea salt and about 300 milliliters of uh, boiling water, which you could also replace, of course, with a vegetable stock. To start making panis, bring to a gentle boil 500 milliliter of water, just a little over a pint, 500 ml, um, together with the clove of garlic for taste and a generous pinch of salt for seasoning.
Once the water has come to a boil, you can fish out your clove of garlic and put instead about a tablespoon's worth of good quality olive oil. Then off fire. You will be able to slowly begin pouring the chickpea flour. And once all of the chickpea flour has been incorporated, you can bring it back on the heat on a very, very low flame and continue cooking it through. Now you will know when it's ready, when it starts feeling a little like a shoe pastry, a really, really thick custard maybe, you'll start feeling some resistance. And here at the bottom of the pan, you will see that it's starting to attach to the bottom without sticking quite yet. And that's what you're looking for, for this uh, panisse mix here. Now at that point, you can take it off the fire and if your mix is smooth enough, like the one that I've just made now, you're ready for the next step. Or if you still find that there are some clumps that it's not quite as even as you'd like it to be, you could go in with an immersion blender and mix it through to get rid of some of these um, bigger clumps of chickpea flour that you have left. For this next step, I am using a brownie tin, which is 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters, which I've covered with a uh, cling film. You could use uh, oil or butter instead. Uh, the cling film is just there to help us with the demolding process later on. And to this mold, you are simply going to come in and pour your panisse batter. Then using a piece of parchment paper, you can begin to push it into the mold in order to create a more or less even base. To begin making the sauce that will accompany our panis, we want a base of mayonnaise. Of course, you could simply uh, make the sauce that I will show you how to make with chopboard mayo if you wanted to. But I thought I would uh, take some time and in today's video um, to make uh, homemade mayonnaise. First of all, because you know what goes in it. Uh, you can adjust the flavor uh, with how you, see, how you see fit into your taste. And most importantly, I thought it was a brilliant example of cooking with your senses because even though I can tell you that this is about 250 milliliters of uh, oil, of sunflower oil in this case, that this is one egg yolk, we're gonna put about a teaspoon of, of uh, Dijon mustard in, in, in our mayonnaise. Actually, the process of bringing it together may mean that we have to adjust some of these ingredients. How much yolk, uh, sorry, how much, um, oil our yolk can take will very much depend on the particular egg and how much oil we have to put in will depend on the kind of oil you're using how fast you're uh, beating this so uh, so i thought it would be really interesting 
uh, to include the making of mayo, a very simple emulsion based uh, sauce um, in today's video. So to begin with, we'll need an egg yolk. There's a little bit of uh, white le left there. It's not, it's not going to matter very much. We'll just season it. Very generous pinch of salt. and a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. And then we're going to go in drop by drop with our oil. Once you've got a more or less stable emulsion like we're starting to have here that is kind of thick and whitening, you can start being a little bit more generous with how much oil you're including. But still go little by little so that you don't have too much risk of it splitting. So of course you could use an electric whisk um, to do this uh, or even a stick blender. But what you'd want to be really, really careful of if you do that is to make sure that you start on a very, very low speed so that the heat that's being caused by the blades or the whisk uh, doesn't cause your uh, egg to scramble effectively. So you will definitely feel when it's ready, both in terms of the consistency that you can look at and also in your hands, it's going to start becoming a little stiffer and here's the final result. A gorgeous ball of homemade mayonnaise, which will form the basis of our white sauce, which I'll show you to make in just a moment. For the vegan version of the mayonnaise, as you can see, a lot of the ingredients will be very similar uh, to the ones that we used in the non-vegan version of the mayonnaise. And the main um, replacement for the egg yolk that we're gonna have today is this. Uh, lovely looking concoction here uh, which is called aquafaba and it's the cooking liquid that you find inside of a tin of chickpeas. This amount is about uh, what you get in a, a tin of chickpeas of this size and this is going to provide us with the protein that we need to create the emulsion uh, for our sauce. Okay so let's get going. So first we need to create a base with a little bit of mustard, Dijon mustard is my favorite. You want about two teaspoons of this there. And as with the um, standard mayonnaise, the mustard as well as bringing flavor will help us with the lecithin that it contains in creating the uh, emulsion that we're making today. Then you'll want a little bit of white wine vinegar, about a tablespoon's worth. You could use another vinegar actually, if you prefer to the flavor of other uh, vinegars. I find that white wine tends to be uh, the more kind of discreet in these kinds of sauces. And then to begin with, you'll want to go in with about four tablespoons of this chickpea liquid. And create a sort of split paste at the bottom of your container. Season it with a very generous pinch of salt. You can always adjust the salt later on. And then you're going to go in with a stick blender. and gradually pour in the oil. And as you can see already, in a matter of seconds, with this stick blender, it's already created a very kind of creamy 
and very mayonnaise-like sauce. So at this point, if that texture is you're happy with, you could stop there. I'm just gonna take it a little bit further. There we go. I think I'm happy with this kind of texture. Kind of coats the back of the spoon really easily. Really nice and silky. To prepare the sauce, which will accompany your panisse, you will need 25 grams of mayonnaise. Here I am using the vegan alternative, which we preferred earlier. A finely diced small shallot, a crushed clove of garlic, about 100 grams of Greek yogurt, or a vegan alternative if you'd prefer, and a handful of finely chopped uh, fresh herbs of your cho choice. Here I have some mint, some basil, and some curly leaf. Uh, parsley. Quite simply, you just want to bring everything together by mixing it in. You'll want to add a little bit of olive oil. Some salt. I really like to go in with a little bit of Paul Biba, this really uh, fatty, really aromatic uh, chili, also known as Aleppo flakes. And that's all there is to it. You could also add a squeeze of lemon if you wanted to have a slightly more acidic version of this white sauce to accompany your panisse. After resting for a couple of hours in the fridge, our panisse is now a solid block that was uh, very easily uh, demoldable, and we are now ready to cut it into strips that we are then gonna go ahead and fry. So you can cut it into all sorts of shapes. I really like this kind of chunky chip sort of style, uh, but of course, feel free to cut it into whatever shape tickles your fancy on the day that you are making it. Hello again, I hope you've enjoyed the video and I hope that you'll enjoy trying panisse once you've made it. As I promised earlier, I thought I'd come back here at the end uh, to offer you a few creative writing prompts. It's just an invitation for you to really consider your senses once again when you're cooking. The exercise is very simple. I'd like you to pick up an ingredient anywhere in your house or if you're not at home watching this you might think of an ingredient. It could be a fruit, vegetable, any other ingredient. And what I'd like you to do is spend some time really considering each of your senses. Starting with sight. What can you see of this ingredient? What colour is it? What shape is it? Really think about what you see. Then we'd move on to the sense of touch. What does this ingredient feel like? What does it feel like on your skin? What does it feel like maybe when you touch it with your teeth rather than your hands? Then we move on to smell. What does it smell like? What does it smell like at one end of the ingredient? Does it smell different at the other end of it? 
Does it smell different after you've bitten into it? What does it sound like? What does it sound like when you flick it? What does it sound like when you scratch it? What does it sound like, like when you eat it, of course? And finally, what does it taste like? What are the kind of sensations you get on your tongue? What kind of flavors that does it remind you of? And in the process of writing from each of those senses, can you come up with any metaphors? Does there any, do any of the senses in relation to this ingredient remind you of anything? Are there any stories connected to each of those senses or that ingredient? Just a little bit of food for thought as we end our session today, as we end this little video workshop. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly enjoyed making it. It's the first time I've done something like this. So I'd really like to say thank you to Suffolk Art Link uh, for giving me the opportunity to try this mode out. Uh, all the ingredient lists and the notes on the recipes will also be available on Suffolk Art Link's website. And if you have any other questions, feel free to get in touch and I'll be back.